Okay, so thank you for coming. Um, thank you for the invitation. It was very interesting to uh, see the talks that I had the chance to see um, yesterday, actually. Um, and it's really a great honor to be able to speak to the Lenora community. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Coxinel. Coxinel is a tool that we've been developing over the past 10 years or a bit more. Um, the, the goal of Coxinel is to help you update your software automatically. Um, also, you can use it to find bugs. Um, the goal in general is to help deal with really large code bases. Uh, so, so as I said, the, our, our interest is the maintenance of large and critical software, uh, code that's written in C. And we have mostly focused on the Linux kernel, but Coxinel is used for other C code. Uh, we don't really know exactly what to actually. It's interesting when you make an open source project, you only find out what people are doing w with it when they complain. <coughs> so. So to give an idea of what our target is, so here's a lovely picture of the Paris Metro. You can see the curved walls, the uh, white tiles, and in the middle you can see a monitor. And if you study, can, it's not terribly visible, but if you study the monitor carefully, you realize that the RATP, the, the people Metro Authority, they are using Linux. Uh, so that's very exciting. Uh, but on the other hand, what's a little bit sad is that one of the way we realize that they're using Linux is because we, they found a bug in Linux because the system has crashed and it's not telling us uh, when our next train is coming. It's telling us that on line 457 or something, there's a problem. Uh, so obviously we can't uh, remove all bugs, uh, but the goal in our work is somehow to help people improve the quality of the software and approve the quality of the software even as it scales. So you can also think about the sort of lifetime of a software project. So you have some great idea, and you want to see if your great idea is going to work. And so you make some simple implementation that kind of has the basic features, does kind of the right thing, and then you can try it out and see if it works and see if it's fast enough or has all the properties you want and so on. And then maybe you come to a conference like this and you talk to other people about your great idea and you say you have a little implementation, you point them to the web page where it is or whatever, a GitHub or something. And people like your idea and they start using it. Uh, and so all that seems wonderful. But in some sense, that's where the problem begins. When people start using your code, then they want new features because it was really a great idea and every great idea can be even more great. And not only do they want more features, they also find bugs. And then when your software gets really popular, then people start to attack it. Okay, so you've brought on yourself all of these problems. So we would like to help people deal with this in this situation after their software has become popular, it has become bigger and bigger, they have more bugs, they need to evolve it in more ways, they can't, they can't live with that quick and dirty implementation anymore. They have to rethink all of the design decisions to make something that's actually stable and robust and can move forward in the future. And a, a really a side effect of all of this is that as the software gets more mature, as we get all those feature requests, after we fix the bugs and realize that actually our design decisions were not very good and we need to do things in a much better way, uh, the code often gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So if you think of the case of the Linux kernel, in 1994 it was only a bit over 100,000 lines of code and today it is over 18 million. So the things that you could do when it was 100,000 lines of code, it's, it, the, that was fairly manageable. 18 million lines of code is not fairly manageable for one person to understand. So how can we ensure that the software can continue to be maintained even when it re reaches this enormous size? And even one million lines of code, if you think about a smaller software project, it's still quite a lot to um, manage. Uh, so when you think about you have some interface in your software, it's not really designed in a good way. Uh, maybe some way of allocating memory or initializing some structures and so on. Um, in general, it's fairly easy to improve the way the thing is designed. You have a certain finite uh, 
fixed amount of code that you have to think about. Maybe you need to come up with some clever new algorithm, but still it's not going to, it should take you a finite amount of time in order to deal with this problem. So you have some functions, you have some data structures, you might want to make them more efficient, easier to use in a proper manner, make them more robust, uh, better adapt them to their usage context, and so on. But then the problem is when you have 18 million lines of code to deal with is that you've changed this interface and now you need to adjust the clients of those interfaces all over those 18 million lines of code. Um, so that's incredibly time consuming and error prone. And then when you make those errors, then you also have 18 million lines of code that you have to fix up. Probably not that many lines of code, but you have to go and search for the places where your interface is being used all over in these 18 million lines of code and fix them up in the right way. So all of this means that developers may feel hesitant to make changes. So they, they see something, they think it could be done in a better way, um, but doing it in the better way means that 500 lines of code in 1,200 or 300 different files are going to have to change. And so then one could think, oh, I don't really want to make all those changes, or I might make all those changes in a bad way, or maybe I'll design things so I only have to make a few of the changes, and then maybe other people will take care of it later. Oh, so all of these are somehow not very productive for the evolution of the software. So we can look at some examples. Um, so the first one is init timer. <coughs> so this is a, init timer was a function that was in the Linux kernel basically since the beginning of time. If you want to initialize a timer, uh, there are some extra pieces of information you need to give it. You need to give it a function that describes what should happen when the timer expires, and you need to give it some data on which that function should work. Um, so you could consider that we also need to tell it when to expire, but that's kind of an orthogonal issue. So this is the only pieces of information that we're concerned with. And so the original way to do it was to call init timer on some data structure, and also at some time to initialize some fields in that data structure, the function field and the data field. And so these are basically three operations, and these three operations are completely independent of each other, and people can write them in the order that is illustrated here, or they can write them in some or other order, or they can put some of those initializations in some other function. There's many different ways we can do it. It's kind of chaotic. It's kind of takes a lot of code, and it's kind of chaotic. Uh, so. Some years ago, in 2016, so this is already back in, way back in Linux 2.6, um, a new function was introduced, which is setup timer, which basically just does the same thing. Um, but it has the nice property that we just get this whole problem over with in just one operation. Um, we can just find this, we can find the complete setup process in a more uniform manner. Um, and much later, it was realized that the whole init timer process was a security issue because it required the function field to be re remain writable, um, and having function pointers that are writable allows attackers to write them, overwrite them with some other more dangerous information. Uh, so we have basically a fairly simple thing. We have code that looks like this. It, it's got three lines, and we just want to turn it into one line. Uh, so I made a little graph here which shows how the, to, the degree to which this has changed has happened over time. So we see in the, at the left side of the graph, it's when the function was introduced. And so we see the green lines going up and the red lines going down. So people made some efforts to uh, actually use the setup timer function and remove some old init timer functions. Uh, but perhaps uh, people lost some motivation and things kind of stagnated for a while. Actually, more init timers got introduced and while some setup timers got introduced as well, we still had things going not quite in the right direction. Uh, and then there's kind of a plateau period, and then it's not until Linux 4.0, which was released in uh, around 2015, that there was actually, we can see an effort again toward getting rid of init timers and introducing setup timers. And then at the end in 2017, uh, when this whole security issue was something started, people started being, paying attention to, somebody made a major effort to get rid of all those 400 calls to init timer and convert the whole thing to something that was more secure. Um, but basically we have the issue that um, we have a simple interface. It's somehow not really ideal in some ways. Uh, something new is proposed. And then it takes an enormous amount of time before that new thing 
propagates over the millions of lines of code, and actually more instances of the unsuitable way get introduced along the way because people maybe copy from bad code or just use the first interface that they stumble across and so on. And so this is one example, but there's, you can see some other examples like this. Uh, there's also the devm functions, uh, which are used for resource management. So in a simple case, there's the kzalloc function, which allocates memory. Uh, the interesting thing about case, uh, allocating memory in a language like C is you have to actually remember to free the memory afterwards. Um, so if you forget to do that, then you'll end up with some memory leaks. It's not very good for a long-running, uh, I don't know, my Linux server, it's been running for a couple years now. Um, so little memory leaks can add up over time. Um, so it was observed that many, there's certain kinds of cases where the memory management is always done in the same way. So if you have a device driver, you often allocate memory and a whole bunch of other resources in the probe function, and those live all the way until you remove the device driver. Uh, so we can exploit that to shift the freeing part out of the specific device driver into the uh, general device layer, and that's where these dev m functions come from. So there's for memory management, there's for all other kinds of resources as well. But again, we see we have a new interface. It solves a problem. It makes the code more robust. It's a good thing. It actually makes the code a lot more simple as well because you can get rid of all those frees. Um, but it took a long time to take off somehow. Um, so here, this graph, I'm showing only uh, certain kinds of structures, certain kind of drivers, the ones that, uh, kinds of drivers on which um, the devm functions were used initially when they were first introduced. Um, so that it's kind of a fair comparison over time. And again, we see that all the way from 2008 to version 3.0 in 2011, actually nobody really picked up on these functions at all. Um, lots more KZ alloc uh, uses came into play in these probe functions, and very few devm functions were used. And then eventually, um, it's kind of the community picked up on them, became aware of the benefit that they could offer, um, and then it goes way up, and the um, use of these KC, the raw allocation functions in these positions in device drivers started going down. Uh, but again, we have this problem to get people to uptake things over a really huge code base, and in the case of Linux kernel, also over a really huge number of developers and maintainers. So the third example is the case of, of node put. Uh, so these are of node get and of node put are reference counting functions for device nodes. Um, there's a lot of operations on device nodes in the Linux kernel, and having all these gets and puts would be a bit tiresome. And so there were a number of iterators that would find that allow you to iterate over a list of device nodes without actually ever looking at the gets and puts. So the gets and puts get hidden in the iterators. But the problem with that is something that is hidden, then you often forget about some. Uh, forget about it. And the problem is if you jump out of these loops, then um, it, you're not going to put the thing on the iteration where you jump out of it. So before jumping out, then you actually need to have an of node put. Um, so then the question is, we can realize that this is a problem, but how are we going to get the entire kernel fixed up? and how are we going to prevent people from introducing this problem in the future. So this in particular is not a simple example of just grepping, because when you grep, you just find, for example, the name of the iterator, but you don't see the go-tos or breaks or returns that are inside the iterator that cause the need for the of note put. And so again, we have a, a similar graph. Um, it takes a long time for the use of the good strategy to take off, and it's only quite recently that the use of the good strategy has outnumbered the number of incorrect uses. So again, as I'm trying to emphasize, we have this problem. We have, different, we have good strategies for doing things. These get introduced into the, into the kernel, um, but it takes a lot of time for those strategies to propagate everywhere. So that's why we propose this tool, Coxnell. Uh, Coxnell is a is a as a language, as a transformation system uh, for allowing you, the person who knows your code best, to uh, write rules that will allow you to automate these kinds of changes across the entire code base. 
So Coxinelle, as I said, is a pattern-based tool for um, matching and transforming C code. We've been working on it for a good amount of time now, actually almost 15 years. Um, it allows code changes to be expressed using patterns that are uh, like the code. Basically, we start with the idea of a patch, and we make it a bit more general, something we call semantic patches. Um, and then you have something that looks like a patch. A patch only is going to work in one place in the code. A semantic patch is going to be able to apply to the entire code base. So the, the goal of our work is to not propose the most accurate uh, program analysis, for example. The goal of our work is to uh, create something that's actually usable by Linux kernel developers, people who are not experts in writing internal subcompilers, writing program analysis systems, and so on. So we want you to be able to work with your code as it is, as you are familiar with it, and describe the changes that are needed. Sorry. Um, so here's a, a small example. Uh, basically, again, we're, are, we're based on patches, and so you have fragments of code, and you put minus in front of codes, fragments of code that you don't like, and plus in front of fragments of code that you would like to replace them with. Uh, something that's very important is that Coxinel is completely independent of the configuration. We have a parser that tries to deal with if defs and macros and so on, just as they are found. We don't run the C preprocessor. And so the transformation that you describe will apply across code for all different architectures. It's not going to be specific to one particular configuration. Uh, so here's an example. Basically, this is a completely artificial example just to show the, the idea. Um, we have a function f. And when it uh, has 0 as its first argument, we've decided we would prefer to call it f0 instead of using the generic f function. Uh, so it always is, it's going to have zero as a first argument when we want to do the transformation. The second argument has another argument. We don't really care about what that is. And so we say that that argument should be a arbitrary expression. Uh, so you can have some things, things that are called meta variables, and they might be expressions or statements or identifiers and so on. They're different kinds of pieces of code, and they can match anything of the specified kind. And then you have other parts of the transformation, which are actually fixed pieces of code, and it's going to match those things exactly. So to see how to use this better, we're going to look at the init timer and setup timer example. So the idea is that you should be able to start with an example of the change and then generalize the change so that it can apply not in just one particular place to one particular driver, for example, but actually to the entire Linux kernel. So here's our example. Uh, this is basically the example we looked at before. And so you can see this has some things that are of interest to us, the init timer, the initialization of the data field, the initialization of the function field. There's some things that are of less interest to us. So in between the init timer and the uh, initialization of the data field, there's a initialization of the expires field. That's not part of the setup timer operation, and so we don't want to do anything with that. And there's also the name of the timer, NS timer. It's not very important. The name of the data value, the name of the function, those are all not very important. So we're going to need to generalize away from them as well. Okay, so the first thing we can do is we can get rid of expires. Uh, so we, we remove the expires and we just replace it by dot, dot, dot. So dot, dot, dot means here's some random sequence of code that we're not very interested in. Uh, just, you know, drift over it and match the other things that are mentioned on either side. So we can do that. Um, then we can abstract away from the timer. It's like uh, some drivers will have NS timer, but some of them will have ABC timer or whatever. We don't really care about the name. What we do care about, though, is... Uh, sorry, there's no pointer. Um, what we do care about is that the timer in the init timer call is going to be the same as the timer in the data initialization and the timer in the function initialization. We also care that the data that we get is going to be going off to the argument of setup timer, and the function argument is also going to go off to the setup timer. So the meta variables are letting us say, I don't care about what this particular thing is, just let it be a random expression, but they also let you make constraints between different pieces of code, these things should be the same. 
and they also help you dis construct the new code, we should make the new arguments out of other pieces of information found in the pattern. And then just to be a bit more general, we can, since we had our allowed arbitrary things between init timer and data, we can also allow our arbitrary things between the initial of data and function. That wasn't illustrated by, exa by our example, but we can just kind of think that maybe it would be useful to get more results right away. Okay, so I, I took that rule and I, um, but, and what you're intended to do is take that rule and then run it over your Linux kernel and then it will update everything, hopefully, in your Linux kernel. You can go off and submit your patches, but it, check that they're correct. Um, I should emphasize that uh, we, we're not ensuring that your result is correct. We let you, we just, the tool is just going to do whatever you tell it to do, and so you have an obligation, even though it's done automatically, to actually check the results. Um, but to, just for this example, instead of running it on Linux, a particular version of the Linux kernel, I collected all of the changes that had ever happened over time. Uh, so there are 828 of them. And then I just ran my rule on that to see how much of what had been required over the entire time could be done automatically. So we get 308 of them. Okay, so 308 of them, is, it's quite a lot of work actually. Uh, for a human to go through all the different files, find the places that need to be changed, make the change, and so on. But it still is a bit far from 828. Uh, so we have not completely succeeded. Uh, so now you can, once you've made all those changes, then you can search for some other examples of things that didn't get changed by the rule that was proposed. So here's one example. Uh, we can see it has init timer. But if you go back and look at the rule, the rule says we're going to initialize the data field before the function field, and this example initializes the function field before the data field. So you can see kind of a trade-off here. Um, since we are making our rule be very close to the code, that's very nice because hopefully you're pretty familiar with the code, so you can express the rule in a way that you're familiar with. On the other hand, being close to the code means inheriting some constraints from the code, some things before other things and so on. So you have, might have to make your rule a little bit more uh, verbose in order to get a more uh, wider coverage. So in this case, we need to make basically another rule that has function before data, or actually we can combine it with a previous rule, so that's the strategy I'm going to take just to illustrate a few more features. Uh, this is the rule we had before. And that what we can do is we can add another option so basically, like in a patch, uh, the column zero is important. So we have minus in some column zeros, plus in some column zeros. And we can also have this parenthesis bar parenthesis thing, and that lets you um, make different options. So we've tried not to deviate too much from the C syntax, but we have to deviate a little bit to make things a little bit more expressive. So here we have two options. One is timer comes before function, and one is function comes before timer. And when you have these, these sequences of options, it's going to look at the first one and do that. If that word works, it just stops there. Otherwise, it moves on and tries the next one. So now we're up to 656 calls, so that's like almost three quarters of the work. Um, <coughs> Again, that would be really a lot of work to do by hand, but it's not quite there at the 828. So we can iterate again, and we can go back and look and see what init timer calls are remaining and why they didn't get matched by our rule. And we can see sometimes they initialize the function in data fields before calling init timer, so those are some more cases that we can throw in. Uh, an interesting thing is that some timers have no data initialization, so in that case we're going to have to find some value to put for setup timer, so we can just put zero. And we also find that Coxnell sometimes times out, or takes a really long time to run. Um, and in those cases what's happening is basically, since we don't know whether the function and data things come before or afterwards, whatever choice we make, we're going to do a lot of searching on code that where we've made the wrong choice. So. Um, there's a way to improve that as well. And in the end, we end up with six rules. It, there's only 68 lines, and it covers 808 uh, function calls. Okay, so if we go and look at the remaining ones, actually some functions that call init timer don't initialize the data or the function field at all, and so those cases have to be dealt with by hand, basically. Uh, but basically what we have as approach, it provides um, 
rules that I think are fairly understandable. Maybe it takes some use, time to get used to the notation to be able to produce the rules, but I think the rules should be fairly readable. A uh, nice feature is that the tool is going to be parsing the code for you, uh, so it's not going to try to update cases where uh, there are other things that have init timer in the name but are not actually init timer calls. There are several examples there. Um, as I mentioned before, it, it's going to work over the entire code base for all architectures, ARM, x86, PowerPC, Spark, whatever, whatever is there. Um, and so it's not, uh, there's also tools like CLang, which can help you also in finding bugs and making changes in your code, but those tools are actually running the C preprocessor, and so they're only going to find issues for one particular system. And we have, in general, this iterative development process where you can write a rule, uh, you can check your rule, uh, you can see what goes wrong. If uh, things are going wrong, and you, you might, uh, when you see what goes wrong, basically you have two choices. Either you can try to improve your rule. Since your rule is fairly readable, it should be fairly easy to improve the rule. Or you can just give up, and you can say, OK, I have three extra cases I need to cover. I just want to uh, do them by hand. Uh, so it's something, the goal is to be able to help you to do the work you want to do. Um, there are actually some Coxino rules that are in the Linux kernel that have been designed to be really, uh, have as much as possible low rate of false positives, that is doing a low rate of doing the wrong thing, and a low rate of false negatives, that is a low rate of missing things. Uh, but if you want to use the tool just for yourself, then you can just write your rule and iterate over it until it does as much as you want it to do. And then you can just move on with your life. Uh, there's no need for it to be uh, perfect in some sense. So to conclude, I'll talk a little bit about how it has been used in Linux kernel so far. Uh, so up to today, there are over 7,000 commits in the Linux kernel that mention Coxinel in some way. Uh, this graph here is showing how it has been used over time in the different years. You can see in the blue dotted lines, those are the Coxinel developers. It's not very surprising that at the beginning we were the only ones using it. We made a great effort to use it to contribute to the Linux kernel so that people would become aware of it and um, might be interested in trying it themselves. Uh, as I mentioned, in 2008 we made it available in open source and then some people started trying to use it. Um, Basically, you can look at the red and the orange lines, which are kernel maintainers and other kernel developers. Note that we have only, these lines only can include people who have actually said that they use Coxinel. So we've always tried to um, make a good example by saying that we use Coxinel when we do something with Coxinel, but people are free to do whatever they want. Um, so these numbers may be too low. Uh, you can see in 2015, there was some, a big peak there for the red line. Uh, some maintainers picked up some rather challenging, rather pervasive things, several pervasive kind of tasks to do. Um, but then actually we, have, we see the same point, high point in 2019 for the maintainers, even though 2019 is not over yet. Um, so we see in general increasing use of the tool. Uh, we looked at um, how have maintainers, just to reduce the number of patches to look at, how have they actually used it? Have they used it for cleaning up the code or have they used it for fixing bugs? Uh, so there's more for cleaning up the code, a bit less for a bug fix, actually. There's a lot of tools now in the Linux kernel that target finding bugs. And so, um, whereas Coxinel is the only tool that actually helps you doing these kind of repetitive transformations. So that's kind of our more um, main focus area. Um, okay, uh, just a few examples. Uh, so the first two we have here are removing unused function argument, removing a redundant data structure. So you can think, well, remo just removing something is not very hard. You just go to find all the uses and just uh, go backspace over them or something. Uh, but still, once you have 11 files you have to visit, or once you have 54 files to, you have to visit, then things get a bit more complicated. Um, and then the third example here I have is for interrupts. Um, the idea, we had interrupt handlers and there was a goal to remove a argument, one of the arguments from all of the interrupt handlers. So this argument was providing a value that could be obtained in some other way. Not very many interrupt handlers were using it, but still it was necessary to go through and look through the definition and see if that value was being used. And if it's being used, then to adjust 
uh, how it's how that value is obtained so that the code could still work. So it affected 188 files, uh, really quite across the entire Linux kernel because interrupts are very important. Um, and the change in each case requires studying the code and actually thinking about it and is quite non-trivial. Uh, and finally, uh, the Coxnell is also used by the zero-day build testing service. So there's a bunch of uh, Coxnell rules, as I mentioned previously, that they're in the Linux kernel. And then every patch that is uh, sent in that is in a tree that's tracked by the zero-day build testing service is checked uh, with respect to these rules. Um, so we see various things. There's, um, if you look at the, there's two options. Sometimes the rules provide patches, so they're going to tell the developer directly how to fix the problem. Sometimes they just provide a message saying perhaps you have a missing lock here, and then the developer has to fix, figure out how to deal with it themselves. If you look at the graph, you see, for example, locks are, missing locks are a very common issue. Um, probably missing freeze and various issues related to API functions and so on. So these are, the, the point I want to make though is these are all issues that are caught before they actually go into the main line. Um, so they're not reflected at all in the numbers that I showed previously. So in conclusion, uh, Coxanel brings automatic um, matching and transformation to the system software developer. So if you want to do something, uh, you don't have to contact the Coxnell developers and ask them how to do it. You can just do it yourself. Um, the idea is it should be, although we, we like to hear from you. So if you do try it and you do run into some difficulties, please contact us. Um, we, uh, as I mentioned, we have no idea what, whether people are using it or not if nobody complains, so complaints are good. But still, the idea is that it should empower the person who knows the software best in, to make the changes that are needed in the software in a quick and easy, reliable, and automatic way. Uh, so we feel that the tool has been a success as it's used in over 7,000 commits so far. Uh, in current work, what we're doing is trying to infer these rules automatically. Uh, so when I talked to David before, I insisted that we were not doing machine learning, um, but we, now we try to do a little bit of machine learning so that you can make some examples instead of having to remember the syntax of Coxinell itself. You can make some examples, cha example changes in the code, then you can infer a rule, and then you can apply the rule to the entire code base and get all of the other calls to those functions updated. Uh, so uh, probably at this point, probably everybody in this room uses some code that has been used, touched by Coxinell in some way. Um, and if you would like to use our tool, you can look at our website. Uh, you can also find it on GitHub. So, thank you. We, we do have time for a question, if there's a question from anyone. Okay, I'll bring, I'll be down. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, three quick questions. One, uh, Cocinelle means ladybug in French. What, why, why this name? Uh, Second question, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll ask three of them, yeah, and then you can reply, and it's going to be easier. Um, you mentioned you don't care about spacing in the pattern matching uh, algorithm, but do, do you enforce spacing in the replacement text uh, and indentation, like, you know, indentation of uh, argument uh, for functions and so on? And the last question is, uh, how is he is your project to use for my own C project? If I don't want to, say, work on the Linux kernel, is it really easy to just okay. uh, use your tool to refactor my project? OK, thank, thank you. you. Uh, so the first question, why is it called Ladybug? Uh, originally, the original name, name was Tarantula, um, <laughs> which sounded more aggressive somehow. But um, unfortunately, some other project had taken the name Tarantula, and so then we searched for a name of another bug that is, eats other bugs. So it's ladybugs are carnivorous. So that was the choice of the name. It's also kind of cute. I don't know. Um, uh, so the second question is about spacing. Um, so Coxnell, uh, by default, it kind of follows the Linux kernel spacing strategies. It does one thing for indentation. It does try to hunt around in the current function and see what strategy you've been using for indentation. So if you're using one tab, it will use tabs for indentation when it feels like indenting something. 
when, if you've been using four spaces, for example, it will use four spaces. Um, if you want to do some kind of strange thing, like some people like to put spaces after parentheses in an if or something like that, um, there is a rule, there, sorry, there's a command line argument which is simple spacing, and that means that the semantic patch is going to follow the spacing rules that you put in the, in the semantic patch rule itself. So if you have removed, if, if basically if you've added an if, and you put if space parenthesis space x y z parenthesis space parenthesis something like that, then it will do that. It will follow that if you give those command line options. Uh, so it's not perfect, but it hopefully will help you a little bit. And the third question was, you want to use it for some other project. Uh, so the main issue is with parsing with respect to macros, because we don't, we're not uh, running the C preprocessor. And you might be using strange macros in your other project. Um, so there is actually a configuration file that you can use to put some information about the definitions of those macros. And there's also a command line option where you say uh, spatch, parse C, and then the name of your pro the directory that contains your project. It will run through the entire thing. It will complain about everything it wants to complain about. And at the end, it will make a summary of the things it doesn't like. So that's really a place to start. You find the summary of the things it doesn't like. You fix up the things it doesn't like. And initially, it will tell you, like, maybe you've parsed 50% of the tokens in your program. And in the end, hopefully, you'll get around to 90% or something like that. And at that point, you can probably just go on and safely use the tool. So the idea is we don't actually have to be able to parse every single line of code. If we're doing init timer to setup timer, we actually have to parse the functions that contain init timers. The other functions we don't care about. Uh, and so if you write your code in a kind of reasonable way, hopefully your nice functions that are doing the changes that you're interested in are written kind of nicely. And then you have some strange macros that do some strange things. Um, and we're not going to be able to parse them, but since you're not putting in it timer calls in those macros, we actually don't care about that very much anyway. Uh, so normally Coxinel, it may find many parse errors when it's working on your code, and normally it doesn't report about any of them. So if you find some part of your code and it's not transformed and you expect it to be transformed, the first thing to do is look and see if there was actually a parse error in that function. But normally it's really not a problem. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much.